the anime summer season of 2022 had a lot of promise. A lot of shows were returning to finish off their seasons. A lot of brand new ones debuted. There are some that I skimped and a bunch of others that I really dug and I want to chat about on this video. Orient Part 2. The story picks up immediately after the first part of Orient and right away the change is noticeable. Focusing on Musashi's group encountering a massive band of Bushi and their leader Uesugi Tatsuomi. They have all gathered to slay a giant Kishin who is threatening to consume Awaji Island. I wasn't a huge fan of the start of part 1. It was bogged down by a mashup of plot devices we've seen in different shonen. Characters are underutilized or hardly developed at all, lackluster animation, and a story that takes a while to get interesting. Unfortunately, part 2 suffers from the same issues as part 1, but to a lesser degree. Having the introduction of other Bushi soldiers gives our main characters a chance to learn more about the world and the evil they are facing, but at the cost for us, the viewer, to see any meaningful development. The decision to split up the trio and leave our protagonist with new squad mates who are very standoffish and somewhat arrogant left me a bit bewildered. I never really cared for these new characters and just wanted to see the main trio confront new problems and deepen their friendship. Instead, it all comes off as a Black Clover slash Bleach hybrid with squads, captains, and super-powered laser swords. I don't mind this kind of crazy though, but having our main characters sit back so that other secondary characters get exposition for a good chunk of the arc was kind of off-putting. The villains have pretty simplistic motivations, which isn't a big deal, and unfortunately, the story beats were all too predictable. Also doesn't help that the animation, while a little bit better than part 1, was still rather serviceable. If you enjoyed Orient, more power to you, I'm super happy about that. Again, these are just my overall thoughts on a show that I think has potential, but it's being dragged down with a lackluster adaptation. Vermile in Gold This show, at first glance, didn't look bad. I didn't know I was getting into a light novel adaptation with a lot of fan service which typically doesn't bother me, but in the case of Vermile in Gold, I couldn't help but roll my eyes. Sometimes I get easily fooled by a series with a nice looking key visual or poster, such was the case here. The animation was simply alright, serviceable in key moments. The world of this series isn't super fleshed out or anything, you are thrown into the story knowing about magic and schools. The characters aren't the most entertaining either. Most can be downright boring and copies of other people from better shows. Our main lead, Alto, is a wholesome kid that just wants to do good in the world. He's shy and desperate to graduate his class by summoning a familiar and through some crazy shenanigans ends up with Vermile, a powerful succubus that is 95% of the fan service in Vermile in Gold. To put the cherry on top, she needs to replenish her strength with a quote-unquote kiss and is constantly putting our main character in awkward sexually themed situations. The power scale and other characters in the show don't really put much of an effort to make our lead character grow. Things just sort of escalate and resolve themselves rather easily. The one highlight of the series, however, is Vermile's backstory, which was surprisingly interesting and rather dark. Unfortunately, everything else about this anime was rather underwhelming. Dropkick on My Devil, this show returned for a third season after a successful crowdfunding. And instead of advancing any sort of plot, not that it had a deep one to begin with, Dropkick on My Devil X decides to spend its time just having fun with the characters in various situations and hijinks. Jashin does get one major arc as she's flung across Japan and is trying to find her way back home, earning money through gambling as well as escaping the clutches from the Yakuza and mob bosses. The introduction of Hatsune Miku was a hilarious surprise, as well as the introduction of several new characters. However, it never really amounted to much, as the show's structure and plot were more centered around having a good time with comical, nonsensical stories. Dropkick on My Devil's strongest aspect is its wild, kooky cast of characters, each unique and rather gullible. There are a lot of goofs and gaffs with loud, rapid-fire comedy that may not appeal to everyone. The voice acting and animation remains a high point, a bright, colorful palette that contrasts the chaos of the show. Uncle from Another World This show has been one of my highlights for me this past summer season. 
However, as of me making this video, the series has been put in a long hiatus as the studio making it has suffered through COVID infections. Definitely a bummer, but I wish them well and a speedy recovery. We need more uncle in our lives. Uncle from Another World subverts your expectations of an isekai. Instead of showing you the typical tropings of said genre, this story takes place back on Earth. The main character has returned from a coma and is telling his nephew about his adventures via recorded footage from his mind. Takafumi being a 90s Sega fanboy was such a treat, a hilarious surprise that I really did not see coming. The constant references to Sega culture had me laughing out loud, and as a retro gaming enthusiast, I was loving it. I can't even imagine how much the license for Sega caused, but to have such a show enthusiastically talk about the Mega Drive and Saturn consoles, as well as feature easter eggs and, and mention things like Sonic the Hedgehog, Alien Soldier, and even Guardian Heroes, which serves as a unique plot point within the show might I add, really shows the uniqueness of Uncle from Another World and the attention to detail on a company so beloved in Japan. Having a character use his nerdy experiences to navigate a strange thing like being isekai'd into another world makes him one of the most endearing and relatable heroes in modern anime. I couldn't help but smile and root for the guy in his clumsiness and out of touch humor as he tries to be up to date with not only his family but the world around him in present time. Made in Abyss, the golden city of the scorching sun. Haunting and disturbing as always, we finally have more episodes of Made in Abyss, which is always a cause for dread and celebration. Picking up after the movie, our trio is headed for the sixth layer, the capital of the unreturned, and in it they will find some of the deepest, most introspective character interactions the series has ever had. The season is split up into two stories, the one in the present with Reg, Riku, and Nan and the other set many years in the past with the first people to explore that sixth layer and the tragedies that occurred at that time. Harrowing at times, this season pulls at your heartstrings with a fantastic narrative about the sacrifices that exiled explorers are forced to make and how the path of revenge and redemption can mold out a city and its individuals. Like the previous material in the franchise, it isn't for the faint of heart. Our trio of characters get more character progression as they are forced forced to deal with an antagonist that is unlike anything faced before. Everything that went into the production of this adaptation was on point. The animation, the sounds, the voice acting, all of the highest caliber in my honest opinion. It's just a damn shame that we have to wait so long for more manga chapters or anime seasons. Harem in the Labyrinth of Another World. I was misinformed. I thought this was going to be another average isekai with raunchy content. Instead, we got full-on sex scenes and not much of a harem. The main character, like so many others in the isekai world, quickly realizes he's in a different world after scrolling through a mysterious website and now meticulously sets out to understand his surroundings. From violent encounters with bandits to spending countless hours killing monsters in dungeons to gain experience and items. Where the series differs, however, is the slave purchasing. Michio ventures into a famous slave trader and ends up buying the second character in this adventure, the beast warrior Roxanne. The majority of the series is soon after spent world building as well as learning about role classes, dungeon exploration, and the relationship between the two lead characters, which, you guessed it, gets pretty sexual. Again. I made the bad call of thinking this was going to be a tame isekai comedy, but it was actually really funny to see the Crunchyroll stream heavily censor uh, the sexual scenes. Uh, the series isn't that great, but there are some ideas thrown at you that are actually kind of interesting, like the roles and economy of this new world. It's just a shame that everything about the series is just one big wish fulfillment scenario for a guy isekai also, did I mention slave purchases? That's a little messed up. Call of the Night. When I did my top five summer shows, this was definitely on there. Not only is it gorgeous to look at with the neon drenched cityscapes, it is actually a fun, quirky mashup of the spooky meets the romantic. Ko is an awkward teenager trying to figure out more about himself and why his wanderlust has taken him to ditch the normalcy of life in favor of seeking the thrills of the night. To make things extra nice, add in vampires to the mix and you've got a pretty fun anime. 
Nazuna is the other half of this equation, and her free-spirited ways is perfect for a character like Ko that is coming into his own as he learns of the potential of becoming a vampire. Of course, there will be the usual shenanigans with vampire stories, but Call of the Night stays pretty fresh most of the time by leaving those plot points in the back burner and focusing on the main character's journey. Artistically, this is probably in my top five of the year. The show is oozing vibes and personality, and I was there for it. I love seeing the heavy use of neon-colored purples, pinks, blues, and yellows to accentuate a scene, and genuinely made me jealous that I couldn't experience that in real life. Those aesthetics, I, I want to live there. Whenever I saw a backdrop, I thought, man, I wish I could go out right now and the sky would be like that and the streets would be illuminated like that. I loved it. Also, the character designs match pretty damn well the original manga and look really nice on screen. And acting wise, I gotta mention, Soda Amamiya crushes it once again, voicing another great character in Nazuna. Call of the Night, it's just one massive love letter to growing up and finding out what true love really means, just with a supernatural twist. Summertime Rendering. This spawned two seasonal viewings, but we finally got the resolution to summertime rendering and I absolutely loved it. I don't want to give anything away, but this story had a ton of twists and turns. It constantly left you guessing which route the plot was headed. Summertime rendering has a fantastic, diverse cast of characters from all walks of life, and they all get their moment to shine and develop. The art by OLM was almost always spectacular in my opinion, with great attention to detail on things like clothing, character expressions, background artwork, and more. From a visual aspect, this was easily one of the best shows of the year. One thing to note is how well paced everything is in the series. Every action is deliberate, and it's followed up in each episode with more intrigue. At times, it can be a little bit overwhelming trying to keep up with the hypothetical nature of the show and the possibilities of it. However, there's enough action and visual stimuli to keep you engaged and actually understand what the characters are talking about. The one thing that this series got right was its ending. As you follow along the adventure, you feel that it was earned. Some people were disappointed by it, but I thought it was a well-made finale, and in the grand scheme of things, really made sense. Yakuza's Guide to Babysitting. This easygoing slice of life story was a wholesome experience filled with adorable, heartwarming scenes. Kirishima's relationship with Yaeka is the highlight of the series. A former angry enforcer called the Demon of Sakuragi is now reformed as a charming babysitter for quite possibly one of the cutest anime characters of all time. While a good majority of the episodes are slice of life in nature, there are moments of story and plot sprinkled throughout to keep audiences engaged. But honestly, Yaika is such a sweetheart that I could just watch a show of her experiences growing up. I appreciate the fact that our main character is forced to confront various aspects of his past life and be a better individual, whether it be work-related or dealing with the memory of his family, having that massive change in his life by now being a babysitter to the boss's daughter gives him a fun character progression arc. Also helping out is the fantastic animation. I really love the artwork in this series. It really pops on screen and brings these characters to life. Shine on Bakumatsu Bad Boys. Bakumatsu was an example of me not paying much attention into what the show was about and just going with it. Unfortunately, that wasn't a successful strategy. I took a look at the cool looking visual key and assumed we were going to get a gritty, feudal Japan drama with great writing and character studies, but instead the show goes for a more conventional plot of themes like revenge, sacrifice, redemption, while also going buck wild with sci-fi and magical elements for the bad guys. The new Shinsengumi characters are nice, but nothing to write home about either. And the art went with brighter colors than what I would have liked. In the end, everything was just perfectly serviceable. There's nothing wrong with liking a show like that, but I do feel like there were some missed opportunities to really make a dramatic samurai story about criminals given a second chance at life while protecting the citizens of Japan. 
Rental Girlfriend returned with a second season, one of my guilty pleasures from 2020, and with it comes the same baggage. Kazuya is still Kazuya. People either love or hate a story with a character like him. Yes, he can be incompetent and dumb, but also honest and sincere in his simplicity. His interactions with the girls will frustrate you if you take this show seriously. Instead, try to see this for the romantic comedy that it is, and not get too worked up about it. This show and its original source material already get enough hate online, and I don't want to be another cog in the wheel. Instead, let me focus on the positive aspects of this second season. Adapting volumes 6 through 12 of the manga, you get some much anticipated moments like the batter cage date, the dolphins, the uh, infamous typhoon, and the surprisingly emotional backstory for Chizuru. When it comes to Rent a Girlfriend, you are in it for the girls and their shenanigans as they try to sway the main character. And I think the show delivers on that. It isn't perfect, dang if I wasn't having a good time laughing along. Engage Kiss is a mixed media project similar to things like Fates Stay Night or Tact OP Destiny where the goal is to tell a multi-layered story through anime, video games, manga, light novels, and so on. One of the strongest aspects of the series is its characters. They're all unique enough where you show interest in their lives and problems. Shu, while not perfect, kind of scummy at times, tries to honestly better the city he lives in. Him having a work partner and love interest is where things go sideways for me. And Gage Kiz is trying to be an action-packed show, but also a tropey rom-com with a love triangle that sometimes is played out for laughs and other times takes itself a bit too seriously. When the show moves away from that and focuses on the monsters and mysteries, it works for the most part. But at just 13 episodes and the fact that it is a mixed media project, you know everything is paced awkwardly to make room for the eventual sequel, for the eventual game, and so on and so forth. There are a lot of cringy elements, like the whole kissing aspect to power up, that I wasn't a fan of, but the premise and setting made me forget about it. Midway through the show, the story splits into different elements without reeling itself back in, leaving some plot holes and underdeveloped antagonists that I wish could have been further explored. But hey, maybe the Engage Kiss mobile app will answer that. One of the surprise hits of the year, Lacorus Recoil, was a wild adventure with memorable characters. It really did feel like watching a high-octane action flick spread out across 13 episodes, featuring fantastic artwork with well-choreographed shootouts and fights. One of the central themes of the series is the idea of moving forward in life. Even after a major setback, how we pick ourselves up, march onward, and learn from our mistakes can determine our growth as individuals. Takina is a very cold, blunt, and calculated person, which sharply contrasts Chisato's bubbly, energetic, and optimistic persona. Unbeknownst to her, Chisato has had issues in the past and trauma that she has chosen to move forward from. The same can be said with a large portion of the cast in this show, who are all dealing with some issue from their past, whether it be about their personality or something work-related. The dynamic of the two lead characters is what truly brings this show to life and makes it as memorable as it is. Sometimes they'll butt heads, and other times you'll see them behaving as lifelong friends. The villains in the show aren't necessarily the most fleshed out, but provide enough incentive for us to be invested in the agents and their violent mission for peace. Overall, the anime had fantastic production value. The art, the acting, its character designs, backgrounds, and overall direction were top tier, and really made for a memorable watch. And hey, if you can get Hideo Kojima to like and promote the show for free via Twitter, I think you've done something right. The maid I hired recently is mysterious. This is one of those anime that I tend to diss on for the lack of plot. There isn't a lot of substance there, and what little there is doesn't get addressed until the very end of the show. And by the time we get there, I kept asking myself, could we have solved this on day one? But I have to tell you all, Rie Takahashi and Saori Hayami are two of my favorite seiyus, and both are on this show, so you know I wasn't going to miss it. Lilith is charming and wholesome. Bit of an airhead at times when it comes to paying attention to her master's statements and declarations of possible love and admiration, but she really does care for her master and wants him to feel like a normal kid after being struck with unexpected tragedy. 
Yuri is an honest boy that is trying to make the most of life, being saved by Lilith from a downward spiral of grief and solitude, and now by having this maid allows him to open up and make the most of his life and hopefully grow up to be a competent young man. Now the shtick here in this series is Lilith and her unusual or mysterious demeanor, her eyes make her seem like she's hiding something, and Yudi is going to try to find out what that is. And that's most of the plot of the series. <laughs> the rest is dedicated to the young master growing up and going to school, as well as befriending his maid. So to summarize, there's not much there, to be honest. So I was mostly coming back week after week because of my favorite actors. Parallel World Pharmacy. I thought this isekai would be similar to all the others where a character sets up shop and sells things to the New World's inhabitants, but instead I was pleasantly surprised with what was presented. This alternate world has magical elements mixed in with the medical stuff. There's political intrigue too, as different guilds try to monopolize and control the city's medicine. Our main character, Pharma, is different than all of this. He is trying to right his wrongs from his previous life on our Earth and coping with the passing of his sister by working with family, friends, and fellow countrymen in this new world, giving the help people need and making society a healthier, better place. Along the way, man's greed steps in and you can probably guess the rest. Visually, it's a solid show, nothing too flashy but still well animated and designed. The main cast is pretty competent and interesting. I enjoyed seeing the protagonist use his powers for good and try to solve whatever crisis was at hand. I will say though, the pacing for the show was a little all over the place. I understand that most anime these days are not picked up for second seasons, so you do your best to adapt as much as you can from the light novels or manga, but in the case for this series, you could have easily made three seasons worth of material out of the mini arcs that occur. Yurei Deko I had high hopes for this one. Yurei Deko had the wildest premise out of the bunch, a futuristic city run by algorithms, social media, and virtual reality. No flora or fauna. Everything dictated by the amount of love one has. Our main character is a bubbly hacker interested in the urban legend of Phantom Zero, a mysterious individual that steals love and upsets the establishment. Barry eventually joins with the character of Hack, the ghost detectives, eccentric characters that are invisible to society and the government. Now by having all of this presented in bright colors and Saiyan Saru's indie art style makes for an interesting watch. I was definitely hooked and wanted to see where the story was headed. Unfortunately, it was just okay. There were great emotional beats throughout, however, such as Barry's relationship with her parents as well as Finn's backstory from the detective club. But certain story aspects were not as fulfilling. The setting is there for a wonderful story about a futuristic high-tech dystopia. The greed and the abundance of love points, if you will, and how much they determine people's self-worth, the parallels are there with modern society. Yet the anime doesn't really develop these topics. Instead, they are just the backdrop for the main character's quest which does get a resolution, a somewhat predictable one, but a resolution nonetheless. However, Yude Deko's greatest strength is in its inventive world building and quirky characters. And even though the ending isn't all that spectacular, the journey getting there sure was a lot of fun. And that is that, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. At the time of recording this, I am like three weeks behind of posting it, so I do apologize. For the people watching later, it doesn't matter. But thank you nonetheless. It's been a chaotic uh, time, so I was rushing to get this out. Unfortunately, it came out a little bit late. So hopefully uh, you enjoyed it and got some tiny insight into a bunch of shows that I do recommend, others that I don't recommend as much. Thank you everybody for liking, commenting, subscribing, and being a part of Awaken Geekdom. I truly do appreciate every single one of you for supporting this channel. So that's going to be it. God bless. Stay safe out there. I will catch all of you on our next video.